Okay, um, good afternoon to everyone um, and welcome to our regular Vaccelerate webinars. So today uh, we have the honor and the pleasure to have uh, a colleague with us, uh, Dr. Maximilian Meyer from the Medical University of Vienna, Austria. Uh, Maximilian will uh, present us uh, the results of a very interesting study uh, conducted at the Medical University of Vienna, uh, trying actually to analyze the variant-specific uh, humoral immunity after active and passive SARS-CoV-2 immunization in a subset of patients with uh, hemato-oncological diseases uh, by comparing the antibody levels after the third and fourth uh, vaccination or by administration of um, uh, a monoclonal neutralizing antibodies and specifically of uh, dixagerimab and uh, gilcavimab. Um, so it's a really very important and interesting study and we would like to give the floor uh, to Maximilian to present the results. Uh, Maximilian, thank you very much for joining our webinar and for presenting uh, the study. Okay, thanks. I just try to share my slides. Okay, can you hear me and see the slides? <clears throat> okay, great. So thanks for the kind introduction and invitation and thanks for having me at this Vaccelerate webinar. So today I'd like to shed some light on human immune responses after SARS-CoV-2 vaccination in patients with cancer. Specifically, I'd like to give an update on the fourth vaccination, which has been rolling out uh, during the last weeks in Europe. These are my conflicts of interest, which are not related to SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. So here you can see the three leading causes of death in the United States in 20. directly followed on the third range. First, let me give you some insights on how COVID-19 impacts patients with cancer and on the additive impact of those diseases. So this is some data from the very beginning of the pandemic. So it was a Chinese analysis, which was published in February 2020. And here, the researchers looked at severe events, which were defined as the need for invasive ventilation or ICU admission or death. And as you can see here, 50% of patients with cancer had a severe event compared to only 8% of um, otherwise healthy individuals. So that's quite a striking difference. Also, when looking at this time to event analysis here, um, you can see that the hazard ratio of 3.5 which is quite a lot. So patients with cancer to do much more when they have COVID than patients without cancer. This is then data of a multi-center registry study, which um, was um, performed um, later on during the pandemic, but still 45% of patients with cancer had to be admitted for COVID-19, 25% had a complicated course, and what's also interesting, 15% had um, long-term um, adverse effects, such as um, shortness of breath or fatigue or so on, which we frequently refer to as long COVID. But what was very important for us as oncologists was that in over 50% of cases, COVID had an impact on nc treatment in the sense of those reductions, deferral of anti-cancer treatments and so on. And that also has a detrimental effect on the outcomes of oncological therapy. So based on these data, all major oncological societies, including the European Society of Medical Oncology, ESMO, issued um, um, vaccination recommendations and patients with cancer were indeed um, prioritized in many countries in Europe and also abroad. So patients with um, with cancer were among the first who received SARS-CoV-2 vaccinations because they were at high risk for severe courses. But what's very interesting, those recommendations were not really based on data on SARS-CoV-2 vaccinations and their efficacy in this vulnerable patient cohort, as all major phase three trials of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines excluded patients with cancer. 
So data on that issue mainly stem from real life studies and also we did a contribution here. Um, it was presented by the, by the head of our department, Matthias Beusser, in a previous Accelerate webinar, so I won't go into detail. But basically, we observed that patients with cancer had lower antibody levels than healthcare workers, which we included as healthy controls. And if we were looking closer at this patient group, we observed that um, the responses, the humoral immune responses differed. Um, between uh, distinct patient groups. So as you can see here, especially patients with hematological malignancies who receive uh, B cell targeting agents um, perform much worse than other patient groups. So these are mainly patients with leukemias and lymphomas who receive, for example, CD20 blocking antibodies such as rituximab. Um, we had um, also a look at how antibody levels evolve after the second vaccination. And as you can see here, antibody levels decrease three and 4.5 and six months after vaccination. However, the third dose, which was by then referred to as booster dose, was able to increase antibody levels in patients with solid tumors and patients with hematological malignancies, which were not receiving B cell targeted agents. However, again, those patients receiving B cell targeted agents had a priori lower antibody levels, and also the third dose was not able to um, lead to a significant rise of antibody levels. This is a figure from a very nice systematic review of the group of Giuseppe Curigliano in Italy. Um, so, as you can see here, there's a wide spectrum between patients who received stem cell transplantation or CAR T cells, which are severely immunocompromised and have nearly no response um, to um, vaccines. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have patients with solid tumors in remission or receiving just endocrine therapy or immune checkpoint inhibitors whose um, immune responses do not significantly differ from immunocompetent and otherwise healthy patients. And in between, there are lots of shades of gray. So which were the open questions by March 2022? First of all, by then, there was many data, including ours, um, analyzing antibody levels after SARS-CoV-2 vaccinations. However, we did not really know what the real life efficacy of the vaccines were. So how many breakthrough infections are there and how does vaccination impact hospitalization rates and the length of hospital stay? Um, second important point, the impact of variants of concern was unclear. Um, in 2021, some variants of concern emerged such as um, Delta and also then with beginning of 2022 also Omicron. And closely related to this issue, also variant-specific humoral immunity was uh, elusive, especially in terms of neutralizing antibodies. These were issues and questions we tried to address and published the results um, in this paper um, published in Cancer Cell. And I just like to give you a short overview on, on, on these data we generated there. So we had a large cohort of cancer patients, first from our own department at the Division of Oncology of the Medical University of Vienna. And for um, our COVID projects, we maintain a close collaboration with the Franz der Beiner Hospital in uh, Meran, um, which is a relatively large hemato-oncological day hospital unit serving a large rural catchment area. So basically, we have a large academic center and then also a, a um, uh, oncological center in a rural catchment area, um, which was also included for our analysis. So this is just to give you an overview on the patient cohort. So about 75% of patients with solid tumors, about one fourth of patients with uh, hematological malignancies. Of note of those nearly 4,000 patients, 2,700 were not under active antineoplastic treatment. So those were just um, patients who were regularly followed up after end of oncological treatment or under best supportive care. And if you're looking at the vaccination characteristics, most of them received three doses and 15% were not vaccinated, mostly because it was their own choice, because we, um, of course, recommend SARS-CoV-2 vaccination to all of our patients. And by end of data cutoff, which was, I think, end of February this year, 950 patients, so about 24% of patients, had a confirmed SARS-CoV-2 vaccination by then. 
This is to give you an overview on the timely course of um, COVID-19 cases, SARS-CoV-2 infections over the time of the pandemic. So in gray, you can see um, infections in unvaccinated patients, um, which of course rapidly decreased with beginning of 2021, as then most of our patients were vaccinated. And then with the rise of the Delta wave and also then with Omicron, um, infections in vaccinated patients significantly increased. If we're looking at that um, and split our group um, according to the treatment they had, so patients receiving any neoplastic treatment versus those who didn't receive any neoplastic treatment, we can see already here that um, in proportion, the rate of SARS-CoV-2 infections was higher in patients receiving any neoplastic treatment as compared to those who were not under active treatment, which also which already suggests that immune responses may not be as pronounced as in patients just regularly followed up. If you're looking at the number of hospitalized patients, again, significant decrease after um, vaccines have become available, but still with the Delta and the Omicron wave, also hospitalized patients um, were made up by um, vaccinated um, individuals. So when having a look at that in numbers, and statistically, we observed that breakthrough infections were more frequent during the Omicron wave as compared to Delta. And as I already pointed out, in patients receiving systemic and neoplastic treatment versus patients who didn't. When looking at the length of hospital stay, we could observe a trend towards shorter um, hospital stays in patients who were vaccinated, so patients who had a breakthrough infection. However, statistical significance was not met, but I think um, these are already encouraging data, also proving that our vaccinations, although they cannot prevent infection, they are already helpful to prevent severe disease in patients with cancer. To look at the immunological underpinnings, uh, we had a sub-cohort of those um, 4,000 cases. So again, four cohorts, patients with solid tumors, patients with hematological malignancies, both with and without anti-B cell treatment, and we had healthcare workers as healthy controls. So those groups received a third vaccination, and about two to four weeks later, um, we performed blood sampling in those patients, and um, by molecular testing and, and ELISAs, basically, we measured the levels of anti-receptor binding domain antibodies. So those are antibodies directly targeting the receptor binding domain of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, which is quite a good proxy for the um, neutralization capacity of those antibodies, which we then also um, measured. So we also... Um, try to measure the inhibitory capacity of those antibodies to inhibit the interaction between the spike protein and the AC2 receptor, which is the cognate receptor um, on human cells where the virus binds to human cells and enters the cell and replicates them. Neric anti spike antibodies, so not variant specific and not receptor binding domain antibodies, where we already see that patients under anti B cell treatment have less antibodies than all other groups. If we're looking then at receptor binding domain antibodies for the ancestral Wuhan variant, we can already see that patients receiving anti B cell treatment are even worse than with uh, generic antibodies and healthcare workers, which was not surprising by the data we had by then, um, were the group with, with highest antibody levels. If we're looking then at the inhibition values, so the capacity of those antibodies to inhibit the interaction between the spike protein and the receptor, the picture was even more pronounced. So again, patients with hematological malignancies with B-cell therapy with the lowest values, and the best um, values in, in healthcare workers without cancer. Those RBD antibodies, as I already pointed out, are variant specific. So if we had a look at Delta specific um, antibodies, the picture is quite the same, although antibody levels were already a bit lower. And that was also the case for RBD ACE2 interaction inhibition. If you're looking then at Omicron, 
Um, still similar picture, but what was striking here was the high number of patients who did not really have significant inhibitory capacity of those antibodies. So a lot of patients who did not have enough neutralizing antibodies against the Omicron variant. And also in the healthcare workers group, there was much, um, um, so the picture was much more heterogeneous in terms of, of uh, interaction inhibition values. So in conclusion, we could observe that in patients with cancer, breakthrough infections were more frequent in the Omicron wave as compared to Delta and were more frequent in patients under active um, antineoplastic treatment. And also our immunological investigations showed um, that humoral immunity was significantly impaired, especially against the Omicron variant, which explained quite well the high number of breakthrough infections during that phase of the pandemic. So, we published that paper in April, and already by the time we published the paper, the ECDC issued new vaccination recommendations. So people over 80 years can receive a second booster dose, which is the fourth vaccination. And independently of age, medically vulnerable patients of any age should be considered for a second booster dose, which, based on the data we and other groups generated, also includes patients with cancer as they have um, impaired uh, responses towards vaccinations. However, there were some open questions. First of all, the efficacy of the fourth vaccination was not that clear in immunocompromised individuals, and also it was not clear on how well SARS-CoV-2 wild-type vaccines work against the new um, Omicron uh, variant BA4, especially. And what was also unclear was the efficacy of passive immunization there um, have been on the market a lot of monoclonal antibodies, including dixagevimab, uh, silgavimab, which were used also in vulnerable patients who have not obtained um, appropriate immune responses after vaccination. But the efficacy of, um, of those monoclonal antibodies was not that clear against the new variants. So um, we looked at that issue um, and published the data um, last week in JAMA Oncology, and I'm very happy to give you an overview on these data. So we had a smaller patient cohort of 72 patients, 75% received fourth vaccination with about 30% with hematological malignancies, 50-50 between B-cell targeted treatment and other treatments. Um, and we had one fourth of patients who received dixagevimab, silgavimab. Um, those were mainly patients with leukemias, lymphomas who had anti B cell targeted treatment, but did not zero convert at all after three doses of vaccination. So this was the group where those patients um, were um, considered for administration of dixagevimab, silgavimab. Experimental setup was quite similar to the um, previous data I have shown you. So we had data um, and serum of antibody levels after the third vaccination. Um, then those patients received fourth vaccination. We again performed blood sampling and we again then measured anti RBD antibodies, this time also for the new Omicron variant BA4, and did also measurements for RBD AC2 interaction inhibition just as I have shown you before, but again with BA4 as new emerging um, Omicron sublineage. So this is just to give you an overview on, again, generic anti-spike protein um, antibodies, and there was no um, really significant change, especially in hematological malignancy. There's no B-cell targeted agent, but these were patients where um, between third and fourth vaccination, um, there were already kind of six to nine months after between those two vaccinations. So that explains this difference, at least partly. If we are looking then at RVD antibody levels, we could observe that the fourth vaccination was able to increase those values also in patients receiving B-cell targeted agents, which was a quite surprising finding, but also in patients with solid malignancies. Um, when looking then at interaction inhibition, we could observe significant increases, both for the BA1 and for the BA4 variant. Um, 
both in patients with B cell targeting treatment and patients with other treatment, which was rather surprising because those were all patients who did not receive adapted vaccines. So all of those patients received the wild type um, uh, Wuhan strain vaccines, which were available by then when we did the analysis. And as we all know, um, vaccinations with adapted Omicron um, vaccines um, was only rolling out during the last um, couple of weeks. Um, also in patients with solid tumors, significant increase. So overall, fourth vaccination leads to increased RBDAC2 interaction inhibition in all our patient cohorts, um, which is of course an important finding and supports fourth vaccination in our patients. When we are looking then on um, RBDAC2 interaction inhibition after tixagevimab silgavimab administration, the picture was rather disappointing. So the neutralizing ability against the Omicron subvariants BA1 and BA4 was rather low compared to the Wuhan variant. So it's nearly ineffective in inhibiting RBDAC2 interaction for those um, emerging Omicron variants. So in conclusion, those data show that um, the fourth vaccination, even with unadapted vaccines, increases antibody levels and also the inhibition of the interaction of SARS-CoV-2 with the human AC2 receptor. And our data support the timely administration of the fourth vaccination to our patients, so to patients with cancer. Of course, some open questions remain. Um, first of all, cellular immunity. Um, one reason is that from an experimental point of view, cellular assays are not that easy also to interpret um, when compared then with, with, with just antibody levels. Um, second important question is that um, we do not know right now how the efficacy of adapted vaccines um, looks like in our patients, also in comparison with the wild type vaccine that our patients received um, in the uh, for the data I have shown you. And then, of course, again, real life efficacy. Also, if emer uh, some um, further variants are emerging, such as uh, BJ1 right now, where we, however, do not really know what the impact will be in the next weeks and months and during the fall and winter season in Europe. Um, so, to get a bigger picture, I think this. Um, big convolute of data has some lessons for us when learning for the next, next pandemic. First of all, I think it's still important to um, speak about protective measures such as face masking, social distancing, testing, and also other antiviral medications and also monoclonal antibody formulations. Second, I think um, those data um, show us really nicely how important clinical trial design is also when thinking about SARS-CoV-2 vaccinations. Of course, it's uh, ongoing discussion and also eagerly debated on whether to include immunocompromised patients such as patients with cancer or, or to perform dedicated trials in this patient cohort. And then I think it's really important to also think about adapted vaccination strategies according to the risk profile, according to the comorbidities, and um, according to uh, immunocompromised states we might have in our patients. Um, of course, we all learned how important healthcare infrastructure is. Our hospital buildings have not been planned nor built um, for the case of a pandemic. And the pandemic also um, showed us how important personal protective equipment is. Also, in terms of emergency response plans, human resources in healthcare, um, also when speaking about work hour regulations for healthcare personnel and so on. And I think we can only overcome pandemics such as SARS CoV 2, which we're working together on a global level. So it's still um, remains important to monitor the infectious situations and epidemiological situations in the whole world, also in terms of um, variants of concern that might emerge somewhere in the world. So with that, I'm already at the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank all collaborators and the funding parties um, which um, supported our work. and. 
I also thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions and looking forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Maximilian. Uh, it was indeed a very interesting and important initial results. So um, I would like to ask uh, 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 the participants if they would like to ask any questions to Maximilian uh, through the Q&A section. Um, until now, I don't see uh, uh, any open uh, question. But uh, um, I, I would like actually, uh, until we see if we have any questions to ask you, Maximilian, starting from your last slides about uh, lessons learned uh, for COVID and future pandemics. Um, so uh, the last part of your cohort study was very, very important uh, because I feel like that we should, from one hand, prioritize and target the specific population and see what could be the future strategic plan to support uh, uh, severely immunocompromised patients that could not benefit substantially from uh, immunization. And I was wondering, since uh, there has been also some uh, similar studies or registries, like, for example, the epicovid echa uh, registry targeting uh, uh, patients with uh, cancer, do you plan in the future maybe to, to expand uh, your study or collaborate with uh, other, let's say, cohorts in order to uh, maximize the sample size? Uh, so how do you envision to proceed with your initial results? Of that? Um, yeah, very good question, which I think pretty much depends on how uh, the pandemic evolves and on how the situation um, this winter season is. and um, on um, how the situations with a, a variance of concern might be. Um, I mean, we had our collaboration with Meran where we um, also have the possibility to, to, to expand um, our cohort. Um, in every case, I think the, the, the issue with, with those analyses is not that much to so to obtain patients with cancer, then also then performing those analyses, which are also quite time and also cost consuming. However, of course, it would be interesting to include for further cohorts. Um, um, because, you know, in, in each European country has distinct COVID regulations, a distinct um, um, evolution also of the epidemiological situation. So, of course, that would be an interesting issue also then to look at um, distinct, yeah, let's call it um, SARS-CoV-2 careers of our patients, as we have now um, patients who um, were infected twice or even three times and received uh, three to four to five vaccinations. So I think um, of course, these are important questions, and it would be interesting to do really large-scale investigations on, on um, also the, the, the actual situation and the prevalence of, of those antibodies in the overall um, cancer patient cohort. Mm -hmm. Fully agree with you, uh, Maximilian, and we have uh, actually two uh, questions. Um, the first one is, uh, what is your opinion? What do you think about having a fifth dose uh, on this specific uh, uh, group? So uh, I know it's difficult to answer, but uh, based on your experience, uh, I mean. I think the fifth dose could be considered. I mean, it, it pretty much depends on um, how also SARS-CoV-2 vaccines evolve. Um, on how variants of concerns evolve and on how we are approaching um, this issue also on a society level and on whether we will have SARS-CoV-2 vaccinations um, similar to uh, influenza vaccines where we have yearly vaccinations according to the, to the, to the respective viral strain that might be prevalent that, that season. But um, Indeed, there are some patients. We also have some patients who receive um, fifth vaccination as they are low responders um, from the first um, vaccinations, but that is only considered now within um, clinical studies and not in a, in a routine way. 
because um, I mean, many patients are asking for their antibody levels and to check their antibody levels. But to be honest, we do not really know um, how high those antibody levels should be to confirm um, appropriate protection against vaccination and also severe disease. So basically, that's, that's more or guess, less guessing. We have some weird value on, on, on a lab report, and we do not really know um, how to counsel our patients. But I think in every case, a fifth um, vaccine could be um, considered in, in patients um, who are immunocompromised, including our patients with cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second question, Maximilian, is actually related to what you just said. So if there are any data on uh, cellular immunity of the fourth dose that could eventually help us uh, to translate uh, in a way what is immunity and protection actually for those patients. So uh, do you have any uh, data related on that? Um, not yet from our group. Um, and currently I'm not aware of any other data in patients with cancer receiving the fourth vaccination. Um, yeah, of course, that's an important issue. A cellular immunity might be the branch of immunity which protects us not so much from infection, but some severe disease. Um, yeah, as already said, I'm not aware of any date out there right now on fourth vaccination. Um, yeah, but of course, important question. Mm -hmm. Fully agree. Um... So actually, as far as I can see, we don't have uh, a, any other question. Um, if this is the case, I think that um, the key messages that you provided, uh, Maximilian, with your last side, uh, slides are the most important to keep in mind. Of course, the main message that uh, I also uh, keep in mind is the fact that even in uh, uh, non-adapted, Omicron-adapted vaccines we had um, uh, with the fourth vaccine uh, uh, schedule induced immune response, uh, which is something that we should keep in mind. Uh, but of course, as you said, uh, knowledge is um, improving. Um, and uh, from our side, uh, we would like to thank you because we feel like that it was a really very important uh, initial step to move forward with this target group and see uh, how we can um, design our future strategies for protecting this patient group. Uh, we will definitely be keep in touch <laughs> uh, uh, as an Accelerate Consortium. And uh, again, it was a really great pleasure. Uh, if we have time, Greet, I saw just uh, now um, uh, has a question. Uh, Maximilian, if you have some time uh, to um, ask you, Reads comment about do you have any idea what the reason is why 15% of patients are not accepting the vaccines and have there already been campaigns to convince uh, these hesitant patients, bearing in mind that these are also high risk patients? That's a very, very good question. It's, if I would have a, a definite answer on that, I would be very happy. Um, I mean, the areas where we made those um, investigations are quite vaccination critical. So both South Tyrol, where the Meran cohort is based, and also Austria are not among the countries in Europe with the highest vaccination rates. Of course, there are a lot of campaigns um, running in TV, um, also when walking through the city of Vienna and also in, 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 in through Meran. Um, yeah, but I think those 15% are those patients that are really, really hard to convince. And also when, when looking at the uh, prevalence and, and frequency of severe disease, which is of course rapidly declining, but also, um, also due to the vaccine, of course, and also thanks to the vaccine. Um, I think this whole issue of COVID as a severe disease um, is not that present in the minds of our patients. I always tell my patients that even if they have mild disease, COVID leads to treatment deferral and that might compromise their oncological outcome. 
I think that's an important um, uh, an important point which they do not really realize, and that's also a point which is not that present also in in public discussion. So that's that's always an important thing I'd like to to mention to our patients. But yeah, those fifteen percent of patients are this group um, of our patients and also in society where it will be very hard to to reach them also via um, public campaigns um, for for the COVID vaccine. Thank you, Maximilian. I, I suppose that in all uh, member states we encounter uh, the same issue, uh, even for immunocompromised patients. Uh, some, some, uh, some, some, some patients are really truly difficult to convince them. And actually, we had a, a recent result from an online survey on patient advocacy groups, including also uh, immunocompromised patients, and we had similar results actually. Um, and this is actually interesting. We need to keep on uh, trying to convince uh, with full transparency and, and with arguments, as you just said, uh, uh, this specific population to uh, complete their vaccination scheme uh, and, of course, to inform them about their alternatives. Um, if we don't have uh, any other question, again, <laughs> Maximilian, I would like to, to thank you for uh, joining and presenting the results. And uh, I would give the floor uh, also to Zanina uh, to close the, the webinar. So from our side, thank you very much. Thank yes, you. thank you very much also uh, from the Vaccelerate team in Cologne. Um, it was a pleasure having you in the webinar and very interesting topic. And also thank you very much, Zoe, uh, for hosting and helping us uh, with the moderation and introduction. And yeah, hope to see you all in the next Vaccelerate webinar in October. <laughs>